Okay, we're back. Um, today we're going to continue where we left off last time, which was episode two of this uh, solo roleplay series. Um, I believe last time, I have notes here, we can go over them. Last time, um, Emily and Asta were going to the bandit lair to see if they could retrieve Ren, save Ren. But when they got in there, they were both slain by bandits. And Ren was never recovered. That was the last we left off. Which means that this session, we have to make two brand new characters and we're going to have to get a whole new party and figure out if they want to go out there and uh, do something about these bandits. Because clearly, these bandits are way worse than we thought. They're not just robbing people. They're like, they're mass killing so I've taken the liberty to prepare two um, character sheets already. We're going to roll them both up and assign characters. And then after that, we're going to figure out um, uh, who's going out on this adventure. So we'll get a, a brand new adventure party. We have our notes from last time. Here's the world that's explored so far. And here's that map of this dungeon which these new characters wouldn't even know about, would they? It'd probably be completely different. I'll say that since the last adventure, about a week and a half has passed, maybe even two weeks. What I'd like to do is set it up my game world so that when a real day passes by without playing, a day passes in the world. So that's what I'd like to try. We're going to roll up these characters now, and we're going to use these rules that we used from last time, which is we're going to roll 46s, we're going to re-roll all ones, and we're going to remove the lowest one, and just assign them straight down. Uh, this 2 is the lowest, so that's 8 plus 3, so it's 11 strength. Uh, let's see. This 3 is the lotus, so that's... That's 11 intelligence. Oh boy. Here we go. This 2 goes bye bye. And this is a 16 wisdom. Holy shit. Let's do like this. Uh, that's a 1, so we roll the 1. And it turns out to be the lowest. That's also a 16. 16 dexterity. This 1 gets re rolled. This one gets re rolled. So now we got a six. This is there. This is a 13 constitution. And here's the last one. Looks like one of these goes bye bye, and that's a 13 charisma. Okay. So we got that guy set up. Let's roll the next set of stats. I've got something boiling on the pot, so I'll be right back. I'm just going to roll that real fast. Get rid of that. And it looks like we've got 12 strength. I'll be right back. Gonna make sure that doesn't burn.
And we're back. Today's meal is a beef and spinach and pasta dish. It's got a vodka cream sauce and it's got some chipotle powder for a little bit of heat. Let's see how this turns out. Mmm, that's pretty good. Okay, let's get to mac bank making these characters. Two goes bye bye, and this is a 14. So, 14 intelligence. This goes bye bye, and we got. I think that's 12 wisdom. This one's gotta get re rolled, and that means it's four is the lowest. And we got a 16. 16 dexterity. These are two very graceful, very quick characters. Let's see. This brings us to, I think that's another 12, 12 constitution, and a last score. This one gets re-rolled, this one gets re-rolled, and it's over here. 15 charisma. Okay. So, we have the stats for these two guys. We've got to figure out what classes they are. We're not going to rush, though. We're not going to rush doing this. I got this delicious meal in front of me. And it's a nice day today. Nice and overcast. It just finished raining, so the air is nice and cool. No need to rush. Sorry you guys got to hear me eat. <laughs> But adventuring and world building is hungry work. Hmm. God, that's so good. Okay. So let's look at the player tome here. Um, we can do race first for these guys. So using our previous rules, on a one or a two, there's a chance that they're not human. On anything else, they're human. So here's first guy. First guy is possibly not a human. Okay. So let's get our 10 sided die. And let's open up here to the index. And here are the races. There are exactly 10 of them. A Durgar. Okay. Our first guy here is a deep dwarf or dark dwarf. Let's use a pen, because this, this is information that is not going to change anytime soon. I believe that the Durgar gets some um, stat adjustments when you're playing with this particular rule. Here we go. Um, ability modifiers. Charisma minus one, so let's take care of that. This man's charisma goes to a 12. And what goes up? Constitution goes up by one, so that means his constitution, which was 13, is now tw uh, 14. It's not a huge bonus. Um, let's pick a class for this Durgar. Um, I think there's quite a few classes in the game. So I might roll this 30 side. 24. Let's go over here. I don't know if there are 24 classes in the game. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. There's twenty-two. Okay. We can't use this then. As much as I'd like to. We'll use this guy. Fifteen. That seems like a number that works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 
So that class is a half work. So we're just going to go down until we see the next available class. Illusionist. I don't like it. Or maybe I do. Let's go take a look at the Illusionist. Illusionist requires nine dexterity and the prime requisite is intelligence. I mean, yeah, he could do this. Okay. We have our first character, the Durgar Illusionist. We will roll a six-sided die on a one or a two. They're lawful, three or four neutral, and five, six chaotic. This dude's chaotic as fuck. Okay. He'll need a name, but we're gonna fill out his uh, saving throws first. So as an illusionist, he gets a 13 in depth. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Here we go, illusionist. So he's got 13, he's got a 14 in wands, he's got a 13 in petrification, a 16 in dragon breath, and a 15 for spells. Uh, we're gonna play with maximum HP starting level, first level. So his is a D4 because he has a constitution 14, he got four plus one, which is five. Uh, his dexterity is 16, so I think that means he gets an armor class bonus of plus two. I'm not sure. I'm going to check. I think that's right. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, dexterity, 16. Armor class of plus two. Okay. So let's give this guy an armor class of 12, which means that his initiative should be a plus one. And his attack bonus is plus zero, plus two. Okay, that's this guy. We'll get. We'll think of a name for him later, or maybe now. I'm going to name this dark dwarf illusionist Jess. Let's do the same thing for this character now. So on a one or a two, this has a chance to be a not human character. Otherwise, it's a human. This is a human. Okay. So now we roll this 20-sided die. 14. And we assign class 14 to this character. So let's see. Oopsie daisy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Halfling. The next class would be an illusionist, but we already have one. So the next class over that to that would be knight. Let's go take a look at the knight. Does our character qualify to be a knight? Don't hand wave stuff. Even if you're you're changing things so that it's homebrew. Try, try not to hand wave too much. So the minimum constitution requirement for the knight is nine, where we got that in the spades. And dexterity of nine, so we got that. Yeah, let's make this guy a knight. So we'll do that right now, knight. Right? Uh, he's got a D of, oh, I should probably write that in pencil. D of 12, a wand of 13, P14, B15, S16. All right, we're starting with maximum hit points for level one plus constitution modifier. So this guy is gonna start with eight. He's gonna have an AC of 12 and his initiative is plus one. And he's got an attack bonus of plus zero, plus two. Let's see his alignment. Uh, one or two is lawful, three or four is neutral, five or six is chaotic. This is a neutral knight. OK. 
Okay. Here are these two characters. They need names. So this one's Jess. I'm going to name the knight Bjorn. We can get that little fucking Euro umlaut in there. So people know we're serious about how European this guy is. Okay. Now, since the last party was wiped out completely, it wouldn't really make sense to pick out anything specific. So I'm going to put all these characters in here. We have a big pool of adventures now to play from. Let's just make sure. Let's just make sure. Oh, no. Emily, Asta. These two characters are dead. So they have to go upside down in the box, in the crypt. Ren is still missing. He's not dead yet or not discovered dead yet. But until we figure out what happens to him, he's also going in the box. So... We have five characters to pick from right now. And we're going to pick, that's right, completely and utterly randomly. We're going to assign one, two, three, four, five. We're going to start with a party of two for our adventures. Every one of our parties will have two adventures possible. One, two. The first is Durif, the half orf cleric. Now we rearrange this. So this will be one, two, three, four, and then if we have to loop back around, we'll do that. The next is Bjorn. All right. So this adventuring party today is composed of Durif, the, cler the half dwarf cleric, and Bjorn, the human knight. We'll put these two characters back into the character bolt until their fate is determined. And since they're not dead, they'll be face up. Dead or missing, I guess is uh, the answer to that. Into the vault they go. Now we gotta pick out Bjorn's equipment. Um, I'm also gonna eat some of this food, because it's delicious. I hope you guys have eaten today. I hope you've done something fun. I hope you've got all your productivity shit out of the way. So you can just sit down, kick your legs up, drink a whiskey, smoke a blunt, and have a good time. The life of an uh, adventurer is very exhausting. So make sure you guys take a, take a full rest. I don't give a fuck, dude. This is so good. This is such good food. Okay. We gotta equip these guys. Now, I believe, previously, I was rolling up equipment in a weird way. We're gonna use this thing. One of these two is gonna help us today. Let's see. Quick character generation. Here we go. Why don't we give them motivations? That might be fun. What is Durif's motivation? We'll go to page six and find out. Here we go. So Durif's motivation. 22. 22. Durif has a rivalry. You know what? Let's write that down in our notebook here. And we should also write down who our adventuring party is composed of. We're gonna use a, a journal to keep track of this. So let's see. Let me just throw my pencils around, that's fine. Day three, party consists I'm so excited, and I just can't hide it. Consists of Durif and Bjorn. Durif, Bjorn, and 
Durif is motivated by a rivalry. Let's figure out what Bjorn's motivation is. We're going to roll this, and then we'll consult page six. This is the right one. Here we go. So we got a 21. 21 to protect reputation. Okay, this is a story I'm c cooking up based on these two prompts. A member of Bjorn's noble um, family, because he's a knight, so of course he's from nobility, uh, is accused of heresy. He's fled, and the town wants his head. Bjorn is going to go out and try to recover his relative, his brother, we'll say, in order to clear his family name. And Durif, he's going to go out there because he's pretty sure a rival cleric from an enemy church is behind this all. So that's their motivation for going out into the world. Let's pick out equipment for these two boys. So here we go. Our first is Paladin. Or Fighter, really. So we'll roll this up. A 14. Well... So we know that the tens digit is the armor. So this guy has leather. We're going to give Bjorn leather armor. Very nice. That'll increase his armor class from 12 to 14. And a four means that his weapon of choice is a sword. The long sword, sword, which does a D8. All right. I think, really, that's about it, unless there's more equipment that we need. I don't think so. We're going to roll randomly on our... Uh, equipment list over here, but that's that's Bjorn's main equipment. Leather armor and a sword, no shield. So let's go to the inventory page. I'm pretty sure there is 24 different kinds of equipment. So in order to get this right, we're going to roll a 12 sided anything else. Uh, if a one, two, three, we just take the number. And on a four, five, six, we add 12. So that's 12 plus nine, which would be 12. I think 21, right? So let's look here. One, two, three, four, five. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Bjorn has six torches. And let's give him one more piece of equipment. A 1, 2, or 3, we just take the number, so it's a 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. A holy symbol? No. We're going to re-roll that. We can't just be giving holy symbols out to Millie. So that's a 10, and we're just taking 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The mirror. Small hand mirror. Small 
hand mirror. All right. So that's our two characters. We're going out today. So do our characters go from the hamlet of Bailey Hospice, do they check out the bandit lair? Or do they think that the brother, the ill-repeated blasphemous noble of Bjorn, brother of Bjorn, Bjorn is elsewhere? Let's roll a d6. And on a one or a two, the brother is at the bandit lair. But on anything else, they suspect he's somewhere else. They think he's in the bandit lair. That means we're going dungeon delving, guys. Let's get a token here. Let me use this for the party. And now we're going to move from here towards where they believe the bandit lair is. So they're following the rumors. Going from town to here provokes one uh, encounter check. So we're going to roll the encounter check. And on one or two of those encounters, so they, nothing happened. Okay. We're going to put this map of the world to the side. And now we're here in the dungeon. So we know that our party enters from the stairway here. Um, let's get rid of this here. And let's get ready to track time in the dungeon. The time is now 9 a.m. Party enters the bandit lair. So this is the first turn in the dungeon. We are going to start exploring because they don't know this area really. They're taking it cautiously. Hmm. So let's um, take our character sheets here. We know probably Bjorn is leading this expedition. It seems like this is a very personal matter for him. So he would probably be down there first. What direction would Bjorn take? Let's leave it up to chance. On an odd, he goes straight ahead, down, down the hallway. And um, on a even, he goes down over here. Even, he heads over to the east. This room is the abandoned lab with the hot pillars. Ten minutes have gone by. We'll track time in our journal here. 10 minutes. Bjorn lights a torch. So we'll put a T here to indicate that he lit a torch. Okay. There was nothing there, so they're moving into the sitting area here with the locked portcullis. Another 10 minutes have gone by, and this triggers a an encounter check. We're going to roll. Nothing. They're fine. They're safe. They come to the locked portcullis. Do they have any idea about where they're going to go next? Well, let's see. On an odd, Bjorn would continue down to the south. And on an even, he's going to check out that portcullis. Nod. He's going down to the south. 
He's at that cross section there. And at this point, he has to make a choice about where to go. I believe this is a secret area and that Duraf has a chance to figure out. So I think it's a one or a two. No, Duraf does not detect that secret door. Uh, they can go down to the room eight or they can go to room nine, the armory or the shrine here. Let's say he's gonna make a turn into the shrine and that's 40 minutes. This provokes another check right here. Safe. They explore the shrine and they arrive and they discover 4,000 electron pieces there untouched. And I think at this point, both of them are going to decide that they need this treasure. Um, these are both neutral characters, so they're they're probably not super like selfish, but you know, four thousand electrum—that's a lot of money. You know, that could buy a lot of equipment. That could rent a lot of um, uh, mercenaries. So they decide they're gonna try and take it. Um, but they can only carry so much. Let's see, what do the rules say about encumbrance? Let's see. You go to 94. Two fifteen in the book for encumbrance. Let's go take a look. Here we go. So Bjorn is wearing leather and so is Jurif. There is 4,000 coins. So they could get it all out, but they'd be, they, they couldn't even get it all out. They need help to do it. Oh shit, this is very interesting. So I'm thinking. Hmm. I'm not sure what we should do here. You know what? They're spending time thinking just as I am. So 10 minutes goes by as they sit and discuss what they're going to do about this. One, two, three, four, five. In about 10 more minutes, Bjorn's torch will blow out. He'll need to blow, set up another one, I think. I'll look up the rules. Hmm. How long does a torch last? One hour, I was right. So after six turns, that torch will blow out. So they, I think they're going to decide to take some of the coins back to town. But it's going to slow them down significantly. According to the rules, characters who are wearing leather armor... Um, they're already like lightly encumbered. So leather armor
Yeah, it's based on the the equipment that they're using, the armor that they're using. These guys can carry a maximum of 1,600 coins, but there's 4,000. And the light armor that they're using counts as 600 coins already. You know, we're not going to track, we're not going to keep their uh, armor against them. So we got to figure out how much coins they're each going to take. And I think they're going to take as much as they can carry, really. They don't have sacks or anything. No, they got to come back with proper stuff. They can't actually take all this. So they take a couple of handfuls of coins. We'll roll 2d6. And that's how many coins they each managed to grab and fill their pockets with. Eight electrum pieces. So they're walking out with 16 electrum pieces each. But they came extremely underprepared. Okay, so 10 minutes goes by. I got sauce on my card. That's great. That's fantastic. Dureth is just a messy dwarf. It's fine. They're stuffed their pockets with coins, but I don't think that's enough to make them lose 10 minutes. So we're going to keep going to the south, to room 8. And that provokes a check. The torch burns out right here. There's no encounter here. But Bjorn has to light up another torch. We're at five torches. All right. In this room, there's that chest with 300 GP. Between the both of them, they could easily grab that. So I'm going to say they grab that chest. Pick up. Chest. Um, Bjorn thinks we should bring this back to town. He thinks it's wiser to do that. And Durif, we're going to see if he agrees. We're going to roll a d20. And we're going to try to get it under his wisdom. Otherwise... He, uh, he thinks it's too hasty to leave now and that she could keep exploring. He agrees. They start moving back. They go up here to this crossroads. Another 10 minutes have gone by. No encounter. They're going to the north again the sitting room area with the lap porticullus and this provokes an encounter check and an encounter happens oh dear now it's been a while since they've been here I don't suspect there's going to be more bandits we need to start creating an encounter table for this area here so because bandits are the most dominant thing here, they're going to occupy two slots on my D6 encounter table. Bandits. But we're going to see now what else could possibly be in this dungeon. We're going to take a D4 and a d10, we're going to roll them, and that comes up to a 1 and a 2. We're going to look here in the encounter table, a 1 on the d4, and a 2. Fire beetles! Well then, fire beetles. How many are in this dungeon total? Let's go look up the stats for fire beetles. Beetle. Fire beetle. There are eight in an 
encounter, but there's 2d6 in a, in a dungeon. So we're going to do that. I'm going to roll these two. And in this dungeon, there are a total of seven. Seven fire beetles. How many did we encounter in this fight? There's a D8 of them. There's four. There's four fire beetles in this fight. Okay. So we need to push this to the side. Let's see, right here. We can push this over here. We need to put this journal away because we're not doing that at the moment and what we do need is a map so let's take a look at what this area looks like so we can figure out how we're going to draw this map I enjoy doing this solo role-playing thing. This has been way more fun than I really thought it was going to be. And uh, I'll probably be doing this a lot more in the future. It's really given me a lot of perspective on how to properly uh, run games, I think. So... This room is 30 by 30, which means we gotta draw it out. Here is the entrance here. That's 10, 20, 30. And then this goes up by 10, 20. And then here is this porticullis. another section right here and then this goes 10 20 30 10 20 30 and our heroes Durif and Bjorn have entered in from the south area here Let's get our two little meeples in. We'll say that Bjorn is red and Durif is blue. And we gotta figure out what the arrangement of this area is like. And to do that, we need a supplement. So we grab Hex Crawl Adventure Supplement that I printed out at the library and very poorly saddle stitched together. I'm sure it's not actual saddle stitching, but whatever. And we're going to refer to this right here to figure out what's in this room. So let's grab some dice. We'll grab this set right here because it's real purdy, you know what I mean? drop it on the table here and we'll move it around move it around so that uh, it's well distributed so let's see a one is a trash debris or ruin we're gonna use green to draw it and it's small it's a small little trash pile uh, ten small furnishings and this was the sitting room so we'll draw benches here a two is lighting this can be a torch lit in the corner here providing light another ten is more small furnishings uh, we can put maybe small tables and 
and these are two twos, so this is more lighting. And I'll say this is one big fire pit. We already know that they're fighting four giant beetles. So let's get these guys on the, on the table. We'll say that they're gathered around the fire. Two, three, four. All right, let this fight start. Let's figure out if any of them are surprised. On a one or a two, our party is surprised. And on a one or a two, the fire beetles are surprised. Neither group is surprised. So now we're rolling initiative, and since Bjorn was leading, we're going to move this, because this has done its job. And we'll put our characters here. Bjorn was leading, so he's going to roll initiative. We roll a d6, we add one, we got a five. The fire beetles roll, they don't get any bonus. They got a four. Our players go first. Well, Durif, who's here because he's passionate about this heretic, loses his cool and rushes in. Five, ten, and he attacks number four. Let's get these rules out. So we know what the armor class is of this beetle. So this armor class is 15. Jesus, okay. Durf swings with his warhammer. He misses. Bjorn backs him up 5, 10, 15. Swings at the four. A critical miss. He swings. We're going to make a save versus uh, Wands to see if he falls over Bjorn. Bjorn falls prone, swinging his first sword. It's now the Fire Beetle's turn. This guy takes a swing at Durif. He adds one. Misses with a five. This one comes over and tries to bite. A oh, crit! Oh no! We're rolling double damage. So 2d4 twice. Four. Oh my god, 12 damage. Durif is slaughtered by the fire beetle entirely. We're gonna write here, he was at six, he took 12, he's at negative six right now. This guy comes over and takes a bite of Bjorn. This was the most unlucky encounter in the world for these guys. He hits, he hits Bjorn. We're rolling damage, it's just a normal hit. Six damage, Bjorn is still up. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll do it like that. And the last one over here wanders off down the hallway, making a clicking sound. We'll get rid of him. It's Bjorn's turn. He stands back up. He sees what's happening. He grabs Durif and starts running down to south where he knew he can run. I think there's rules for evasion. I'm gonna look these up. Let's see. Oh. 
ability checks, saving throws, death, healing, hazards, and challenges. Oh my goodness. Okay. Evasion. Here we go. Let me check their morale to see if they follow them. We're going to roll 2d6. And if they succeed on their morale check, they're chasing. Otherwise, they're going to stay here and ignore them. Six. Let's see. The fire beetle has a morale of morale of seven. He failed. Okay, these beetles stay here. There must be something important here that they're not chasing, and these boys get away. Or at least we know that they're not chasing. Oh, actually, no, no, no. Since they're not chasing, there is no pursuit. This is interesting. I've never looked through this. Very interesting. Okay. I did not know about these things. So that's good to know. In this room here, the fire beetles have stopped chasing, presumably because there's something more important to them there. And Bjorn drags Duraf's body to the south. That encounter was dangerous. Fire beetles are really hard hitting monsters. I am going to invest in some awesome, uh, what do you call it, Windex, <laughs> Windex stuff to help clean. Because as nice as it is to be able to erase, um, you know, to have erasable things, the smudges here piss me off. Okay, here we go. We're back here. Let's get... Um, let's get our journal here so we can continue to write about what's happening. Here we go. So we'll say that that encounter was about 10 minutes to escape. And now they're in this crossroads going to room 9. They're back at the shrine area. Uh, Durif is really hurt. Uh, we're going to see if he bleeds out. We're going to say he bleeds out once before Bjorn can try and bandage him. He loses three more HP. So he's at negative nine. And his constitution is 12, which means he can go to negative 12 before he dies. Bjorn's going to spend 10 minutes treating his wounds. But that's going to provoke a wandering monster check. 
Let's see. A two. Oh my goodness. Let's check this thing right here and see what it is. Bandits. How many bandits? Two bandits. Oh my lord. Okay. Bjorn sees the two bandits and the bandits see Bjorn bandaging Durif. Let's figure out what they are, uh, how they react to the players. And we'll get two six sided dice, and that's a two. They immediately attack. There's no time. There is no time for Bjorn to um, do anything else except finish bandaging up. Duraf. Duraf is at 1 HP when this fight starts. Back onto the battle board. Now, I already have an idea of what this shrine looks like, so I'm not going to use that supplement. This is a 30 by 30 room, so 10, 20, 30. 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30, and then the doorway or the hallway is from here. There is a pool here, and all around and inside the pool is the treasure. We'll say that here is Bjorn, and here is Duraf, and here are our two bandits. On a one or a two, one of the bandits is a captain. No, no captain. These are just two ordinary slovenly bandits. Let's see, is either side surprised? Let's get some dice and figure that out. The yellow is our party and the blue is the bandits. On a one or a two, that side is surprised. Yellow are bandits, they're surprised. Our players get one free round before the Bane attacked. Bjorn charges five and he attacks. He gets a plus two. He misses completely. Duraf hangs back. This does not seem to be going well at all. At all, my friends. The new round starts and now we roll initiative. Yellow for our bandits, yellow for our players, and white for our bandits. I think I have to try and remember that. Yellow for players, white for bandits. Players go first to get another turn. Uh, Bjorn takes a swing at number five. That's a hit. That is a hit. We're rolling damage. Five damage. How much HP do these bandits have? We're going to use the median HP. We're going to use whatever value is in the book. Bandits have 4 HP. That guy's dead. Durf charges in, takes a swing, adds 1. For a total of eight, he misses. The bandit goes now. He takes a swing at Duraf. He hits. Oh, my lord. And he swings for 1d6. It doesn't matter, though. Because he's out no matter what. He's at minus one. Duraf is down again. Bjorn takes a swing at the last bandit. He hits and he rolls his d8. Six damage. Both bandits are dead. They have some treasure though. Let's see. Treasure type U. 
Well, treasure type U. Let's see. Right here. Let's see if they have anything of import. We'll get out our trusty percentage dice. 10% chance of copper. Nope, that's a 21. Uh, let's do like this. 10% chance of silver. No silver. 10% chance of gold. Oh, 5% chance of gold. No gold. 5% of gems. No gems. 5% jewelry. No jewelry. 2% magic item. Nothing. Which means we're taking the average. 160 gold pieces. I've decided that. If I roll nothing on this treasure, we're just going to take the average. Because they're not, they're not leaving empty-handed. 160 coins is nothing to smirk at, though. We're going to write this down here. Hundred and sixty gold. So Bjorn has to spend another ten minutes bandaging up Duraf, which provokes yet another wandering check. Nothing happens. Ten minutes go by, and he manages to stabilize Duraf again. I wonder. Let's do um. Let's check Duraf's constitution. If he fails, being downed twice in one session means he has a, a wound of some kind, a long-lasting injury. He's fine. No, no long-lasting injury. We'll write down that rule for later. That should make the game a little more dangerous for our characters. So let's clean up this again. And let's come back here. So, at this point, Duraf is thinking they should get out with what treasure they have. They're worried about going to the north, so we go back here. We're going to test to see if Duraf notices that secret passage. He does. He does. We're going to write that down in our journal so that we know for next time that Duraf knows what the secret passage is. Duraf discovers secret passage. And as they discover the secret passage, this provokes a wandering monster check on a one. Nothing. They're fine. Another torch has to be lit. Bjorn is down to four torches. Four. They go down the hallway and arrive at five, the bunker. Let's see. We're going to check both of their wisdom to see if either of them can figure out which way to go from here. No, they're lost. So we're going to roll, and on an odd, they go south. On an even, they go north. We're not going to get a choice. Even, they wander towards the north. From room five to room four, a sitting room. They continue to the north. And right here provokes another check. Will they get out of this dungeon before they get caught by something else? They will. They leave. They escape. So.
So Bjorn and Duraf had spent a total of one, two, two hours and 40 minutes in the dungeon. So we're now at, we're going to say 12 noon. At 12 noon, they exit the bandit lair and they make their way back to town to roll a d6 and see if they have an encounter going back to town. On a one or two, an encounter happens. Nothing. They made it back to town. They brought back some treasure. Finally, they tell the tales to the people of Bailey Hospice of these fire beetles that they encountered. And they found treasure in the a shrine area, a big pool with hundreds and thousands of coins. They couldn't possibly carry it all. So they're going to have to rest up because they're both badly, badly beaten. Which means that for at least one adventure, they're going to need to rest. Um, we'll say that they pay their gold coin in order to spend the night at the tavern and get some rest. So Jurf and Bjorn go out seeking this noble, this brother of his, this blasphemous brother. They suspect he's in the bandit lair, but those beetles have proven to be really dangerous. Uh, we got to give them experience now, don't we? So they managed to kill two bandits, and they brought back home 160 gold and then 16 electrum pieces. That's two gold each for each electrum piece. So let's figure out how much a bandit is worth first. Then we can figure out their total XP. So bandits are worth 10 each, so that's 20. We're going to write this down. Exit bandit layer. So XP is 20 XP for bandits. And then 16 times 2 is 32 XP. Because, uh, you know, each gold piece is worth 1. So if this is 2 each, that would mean this is 32. We add 32 to 160 for 192. And we add 20 to 192. And that gives us our grand total. So it's 112 XP. 212 XP each. Well, total. And we divide that in half, and that's how much both of these boys get. So we'll put it on the back, since it's easier to keep track of that way. 212 divided by 2 is what, 106? So 106 XP here for Durif, and 106 HP here for Bjorn for successfully bringing back some coins and defeating those bandits. Bjorn is not entirely convinced that this bandit lair is where his brother would be. Seeing as it's full of those giant fire beetles, he's not sure his brother would be able to stop or defend himself against those beetles. However, Durif points out that if his brother was as indeed as heretical as claimed, then perhaps he had some diabolical means to circumvent those beetles, or perhaps he's much stronger than Bjorn thinks. And his last accusation is he believes that Bjorn's brother is in cahoots with the bandits. So Durif makes an accu accusation of Bjorn's brother of truly being evil. We'll see how Bjorn takes that. We've got a six. Bjorn is uncertain about how he feels about that. He's not sure whether it's true or not. 
So he just says to Durf that until they can confirm it or not, they're going to keep looking there for his brother. And he doesn't, he doesn't think that. He really, truly doesn't think that. That's where his brother is. Okay. So that'll be the adventure for today. Um, I'll continue this another time. But for now, our party consists of Bjorn and Durif. And they will continue to try and penetrate this bandit lair to figure out what happened to Bjorn's brother. Until then, this has been a good time, and I'll catch you in the next uh, episode of the Solar Roleplay.